Eight years ago, I began working on my master's degree through a university out in Montana. Most of the classes were online, since I was already a full-time teacher, but a few of them required me to go out and study in Yellowstone National Park. I chose that master's degree on purpose just so I would have to go out and study in Yellowstone. The experiences I had in Yellowstone and what I learned occurred over multiple trips to visit, but I condensed it all into one experience for this podcast episode to make it easier to follow along. We drove from the college campus to Yellowstone together in two large vans. Once reaching the park, I recall us stopping as a group and our professor pulling out a large geological map of Yellowstone. Geological means studying rocks and land features. Then he pointed all around us in the park and said, there's marine sediment, and there's marine sediment, and there's marine sediment. All around us was evidence of a worldwide flood, as the Bible describes. Marine sediment everywhere. Then we continued towards some cliffs that didn't look especially like much, but are the original place for many, many Native American arrowheads. The cliffs were obsidian, which is an igneous rock that is black, shiny, and smooth like glass. Igneous means it is magma or lava that is hardened. Remember, magma is underground, lava is on the surface. Igneous means fire, because magma and lava are so hot. Igneous sounds like the word ignite, so igneous rocks were once hot rocks that cooled, and obsidian is one of these rocks which cooled so quickly the atoms didn't have time to arrange into crystals. Thus, you get a smooth, glassy surface. It is great for making sharp tools like an arrowhead. That's why so many arrowheads from around the central and western part of the country can be traced back to those specific cliffs in Yellowstone. In fact, some artifacts from Yellowstone were transported all the way to Ohio in the eastern United States, about 1,500 miles away, or over 2,400 kilometers. Loading back into the van, we continued to visit some rapids. What was interesting about those rapids, according to our professor, is that he's been visiting Yellowstone his whole life, and those rapids weren't there when he was a kid. They are new. That's because the ground of Yellowstone is moving. One part of the ground shifts up from the pressure and heat underneath, which causes the river to fall more rapidly, creating rapids. He also showed us a light-colored beach area along Yellowstone Lake. Again, he said that wasn't always there. Years back, the beach was on the other side of the lake. How did that happen? The whole land of Yellowstone is shifting back and forth. Yellowstone Lake is sloshing back and forth, as in slow motion, taking years for a beach to become exposed on one side of the lake. Then, as the land tilts upward, a beach is exposed on the opposite side of the lake later on. Yellowstone is very much like the lid on a pot of boiling water, tilting this way slightly, then that way, as heat and pressure push their way up from underneath. Finally, we made it to our campsite for the night. As far as I knew, I was the only Christian in the group, and definitely the only creationist in the group. A creationist is someone who believes the world was created by God, as the Bible states. While I didn't tell everyone I was a Christian, I didn't go out of my way to hide my relationship with God either. Someone sounded upset as we set up camp. We found out that their tent had a broken pole and couldn't be set up. It was the main pole of their tent. Then I remembered I had a repair kit with the precise piece he needed. But had I forgotten to bring it on the trip? I talked with God about it quietly as I went back to the backpack to feel for it. God, did I bring it? Will you let it be there? I reached into the backpack and felt the small plastic bag of the repair kit. I had it! As I walked back to the man with the repair kit, Words naturally flowed from my lips in appreciation for God helping me remember to pack it. Praise God, I have what you need to fix your tent. Gratefully, he used the small, hollow metal tube which held the broken tent pole in place so it could hold up the tent. This trip was turning out to be an interesting place to talk about God. The next day, we woke up ready for more Yellowstone adventures. We ate loaded up the van, and made our way to one of the most photographed spots in Yellowstone. 
grand, prismatic spring is beautiful. Often, when people see pictures of the spot, they ask, Where in the world is that? It's a spring with the color of Kool-Aid blue water and the middle, which fades into sulfur yellow and sunset orange on the edge. It looks beautiful, but the signs on the boardwalk remind visitors that the water is boiling. I remind myself to be careful, even as I take hundreds of pictures. The whole time, steam is rising from the water because even in the middle of the summer, the water is far hotter than the air temperature. If you ever visit Yellowstone, be sure to walk next to Grand Prismatic Spring very carefully. We drove on close to the lake and saw a large area next to the road that looked like a random little pond next to the lake. It's called Indian Pond. There was an explosion there, our professor said. It was a hydrothermal explosion. I looked again and saw that a large soccer field would have been blown away, literally. With hydrothermal explosions, the water heats up underground and pressure builds. Then the water explodes as steam, hurling dirt and rock out of the area. The crater that was left there filled up with water and became known as Indian Pond. Look for a picture of it online. Finally, we made it to Old Faithful, where after a short wait with hundreds of others, the geyser erupted high into the air. Visiting Old Faithful and seeing it erupt has always felt like one of those things people are supposed to do in the United States, like seeing the Statue of Liberty or driving across the country on a road trip. It was neat to see and experience, so I can say, yes, I've seen Old Faithful and Yellowstone. There were more geysers, mud pots, and travertine terraces to see throughout the day. I took many, many pictures. Tower Falls, Mammoth Hot Springs, Norris Geyser Basin. As we were walking along one of the boardwalks, a girl paced next to me and said, You're a Christian, aren't you? I don't remember much of the conversation, but there was something in the way I talked and walked that showed her I belonged to Jesus and it made me feel really good. Sometimes, just by the way we act, others might notice that we belong to Jesus, even if we're learning about the geothermal features of Yellowstone. This was just a quick snapshot of what it was like to be in Yellowstone. It's difficult to relay so much of the information I learned over days of studying there, and it's impossible to share the smells of the meadows, the heat of the hot springs nearby, the smell of sulfur, the traffic jams because of bears and moose, and the darkness of night while camping under the stars. Nonetheless, I hope you enjoyed reliving some experiences with me from Yellowstone. If you haven't already seen, check out pictures from this very trip on our Facebook page. Look for Nature and Science for Kids. If you have any pictures from a trip to Yellowstone, or maybe your parents do, please send one in an email to me and I'll share it on Facebook. Email them to natureandscienceforkids at gmail.com. Also, I'm so excited to share our new website, moosejawmat.com. On there, you'll get the most recent episode releases, all the previous episodes, and see the podcast store with t-shirts, stickers, and other books about nature and science. Thank you for joining me in this Yellowstone adventure. I hope you've had as much fun as me. I'm Moose Jaw Matt. Until next time, keep exploring your world 